Number 10, the NDAs. Confidentiality agreements are not uncommon in the world of Hollywood. Marvel will literally have someone take you out even if a single line leaks to the public. In Kitty Kelly's tell all book about Oprah, the author mentions the confidentiality agreements that co workers and guest stars are made to sign. This included everyone from Tom Cruise to the person who made his muffins. Over 500 staff members were forced to sign this document, and one former employee, Elizabeth Cody, tried to write a book about her time working for Oprah, but she was apparently stopped by the courts. Still being tied to the agreement that she had signed. The NDAs were not meant to be a way to just keep like show secrets safe, but any and all of Oprah's secrets as well. According to Elizabeth, the documents were signed by almost everyone in her life. She may have this brand of sweetness and kindness, but that is not how she is. Elizabeth felt that she was in Oprah's pocket after she signed the paperwork. In 2010, a lawsuit was filed against Oprah and her company, Unicus Performance Training, claimed that they were fired for violating the terms of her agreement, specifically involving advertising with her name or the website or the show. Number 9, a diva. On air, Oprah is portrayed as a wholesome, sweet lady, but according to her stepmom, there is an unknown side to this woman. Hidden from fans for years, according to Barbara, Oprah is one of the most controlling people you'll ever meet. She claims that Oprah would not allow them to stay at her house when they tried to visit, forcing them to stay in hotels with money out of their own pockets. Barbara also said that Oprah was quick to anger when it came to her staff, with several people being fired left and right over the years, but that's not all. Despite being a billionaire, Barbara allows her to stay at her home for visits, something that Oprah apparently hates. The first time she stayed over, Oprah allegedly complained that her bed sheets were not a thousand threads and her bath towel wasn't big enough. I get the bath towel thing. Big bath towels for the win. Never going back. This woman has billions of dollars to do literally anything she wants, and what she wants to do apparently is just make her stepmom's life a living hell. Number 8, Controversial Beliefs Oprah has had plenty of controversial people on her show, from medical experts, fake psychologists, to celebrities. Whatever's good for TV is good for Oprah, but one particular incident that caused a ton of backlash for Oprah was when she did an interview with Suzanne Summers. She was brought onto the show to share her beauty secrets and how she was able to look so young. Well, according to some, this treatment that she does on a regular basis will help. Suzanne claimed that she rubs estrogen cream into her skin on one arm and smears progesterone onto the other arm. Progesterone is just a fancy way of saying steroids. She also claimed that she took 60 supplements and vitamins a day, 40 in the morning and 20 before bed. What really stirred the pot was that this woman claimed to be a health expert and a self-help author, but surprise, surprise, doctor, she is not. Medical experts started bashing Oprah, claiming that this type of extreme hormone therapy would actually be the cause of several diseases and illnesses, you know, like cancer. Despite Suzanne's claims that her specially made non-FDA approved bioidenticals are natural and safe, they're actually just synthetic conventional hormones that you can buy at a pharmacy. Oprah did everything in her power to sell this idea to her audience, believing 100% percent of the methods were useful, even claiming to have used some of these methods that made her feel incredible. So this lady would rather risk her audience getting cancer than just telling them the truth. That is solid. Number 7, an advocate for Maui. Oprah was claiming to be many things during the whole Maui backlash thing. A good boss, a charitable woman, and an advocate for the island of Maui. By starting her Maui fund and donating her spare millions, she made her mark in the public as a woman who she cares so much that she's asking you to give her money as well. Isn't that nice? As I've mentioned in previous videos, Oprah would not care about Maui or its people if she didn't have a vested stake on the island. Oprah's had property in Maui for quite some time, being almost a second home to her, and when the fire started raging, she started funding. But think about all the other things that have happened in the past couple of years around the world. We all forgot about Australia on fire in 2020. Western Canada was on fire at the beginning of this year. Some parts of Florida have been underwater for months, yet Oprah has decided to dedicate her time and money to helping an area where she has a vacation home. Number 6, the free cars. Now, who could forget Oprah's famous words, you get a car, you get a car, everybody gets a car. The moment was historical on her series. and was parodied time and time again, and it still does get parodied to this day. However, what a lot of people don't know is that it wasn't as simple as, here are some keys, have fun. When someone gives out anything on television, there's a catch. For Oprah's audience, the catch was, if they wanted to drive away in a brand new car, they'd have to pay $7,000 in taxes first. While Oprah's studio would cover the sales tax and registration for each car, which was a lot, the audience members were given a choice to either pay the seven grand and take their car home, or just simply take the cash instead. The infamous moment on the show featured 11 teachers who were, according to Oprah, in desperate need of a car. They, along with the audience, received keys in a box on camera that Oprah claimed to be for their new cars. Everything
everything has a catch even now. For someone who is known to be charitable and generous, the word free really means something different to Oprah. Number 5. There were fabricated memoirs Oprah launched her book club in 1996, a reading encouraging segment from her talk show. It turned any book that she liked into a bestseller. In September of 2005, she picked A Million Little Pieces, a brutal and painful memoir by James Frett about his years long struggle with substance control issues. A Million Little Pieces became a best-selling non-fiction book of that year and Frey was asked to appear on her talk show to discuss the book. Oprah called it gut-wrenching. However, the following year, a news outlet ran a pretty expositive article about Frey after it was discovered that he made up or juiced large portions of his memoir. For example, there's a section of the book that tells a story of Frey surviving a fatal crash that took the lives of two teenagers when he was never on that train nor had any involvement in the situation. Weeks after the article broke, Oprah asked Frey to come back onto the show where he faced livid viewers and an even more livid Oprah. She told James that she felt duped and betrayed, a feeling that was shared by her audience and millions of people around the world. She asked why James felt the need to lie to herself and the readers and he tried everything, making every excuse that he could think of. He claimed that he altered a lot of the details, but that the overall plot was real. The studio audience responded with waves of boos and gasps and groans. Winfrey later apologized for the mistreatment from her audience because it wasn't her intention, but the damage had already been done. His career as a writer is currently non-existent. Let's talk about some of the celebrities that she has had interactions with. Number 4. Cindy Crawford Model and actress Cindy Crawford has called Oprah out over their 1986 interview that took place on her show, where Oprah asked the then 20 year old to expose herself to the crowd. Crawford reflected on the interview in a new documentary called The Supermodels on Apple TV+. Plus. Everyone has a plus now. The documentary spotlights the careers of several models like Naomi Campbell, Linda Evangelista, and of course Cindy Crawford. In a clip from the documentary, Winfrey is heard introducing the then aspiring supermodel to the Oprah Winfrey show before she is asked, did she always have this body? I mean, this is unbelievable. Come on, stand up. Now that's what I call a body. Thank you, that's my impression of Oprah. She is visibly uncomfortable and sheepishly stands up before the studio audience cheered as she showed off her figure. According to Cindy, she felt like a child in that moment being told what to do by her superior. She felt that the moment was more of a show us why you're worthy of being here type situation than anything else. At the time, this was just some weird thing that Oprah asked her to do, but it morphed and mutated into one of the most uncomfortable moments in her early years in modeling. The most shocking thing for her was the fact that it was Oprah Winfrey trying to tell her what to do. The woman who was known for her kindness and generosity made her feel like a puppet. Number 3. Where's the beef? In spring of 1996, the United Kingdom apparently experienced an outbreak of bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or mad cow disease, since I probably butchered that last part. According to the FDA, the disease destroys cows' central nervous system, and if humans eat it, then we get zombies! No, but they uh, can contract a deadly variant called Kreutzfeldt Jacob disease. During the mad cow scare, the Oprah Winfrey show booked Howard Lyman, the former cattle rancher, had adopted a vegetarian lifestyle, and he went to work for the Humane Society's Eating with Conscience Animal Welfare Campaign, and he appeared on the show to discuss the threat of mad cow to Americans. He pointed out that feeding the remains of mad cow to infected cattle or any other animals could have facilitated a spread, and such practices were apparently common in the United States. Oprah was stunned and vowed that she would never eat a burger again. And it turns out her influence and her millions of viewers were so large that only a few hours after that statement and the episode aired, she declared to never eat a hamburger ever again and the price of beef stock plummeted, staying at an all-time low for two months. One Texas rancher actually lost an estimated $6.7 million that year and organized a class action lawsuit against Oprah and her show for talking trash about American beef. After about six weeks of a trial, she won, leaving one man with no farm and out thousands of extra dollars in legal fees. Number 2. Tom Cruise Despite this man being in the Mission Impossible franchise, he's been in a lot of movies produced by himself. You didn't think Hollywood forgot about Oprah, did you? Following the announcement that he was engaged to Katie Holmes in the early 2000s, Tom appeared on an episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show and it has gone down as one of the most iconic TV moments of all time. From the moment he steps on stage, things are just going wrong. He throws arms in the air, he rubs Oprah's shoulder like she's got a stain that just won't come out. Tom jumped on her couch, grabbed her hands over and over. She couldn't even get any questions out. Eventually, Oprah was like, okay, I'm done. Bring Katie out. And then Tom is just running through the hallways as cameras follow him Blair Witch style. The moment cemented Tom as a man with many hidden personalities, and while it has not affected his work as an actor per se, ever since that day, whenever he's brought in for press of any kind or interviews, all entrances and exits must be locked at all times for everyone's safety. Again, this man may be in movies still, but they're rarely anything new or good. Number one, Whoopi Goldberg. In author Kitty Kelly's unauthorized Oprah biography, Kelly claims that Whoopi
Whoopi Goldberg became a persona non grata or an unwelcome person to Oprah after Whoopi was nominated for an Oscar for her role in the original version of The Color Purple. The book noted that following the honor, the comedian never appeared on Oprah's show again and was noticeably shunned from her 2006 Legends Ball. It wasn't until Oprah invited the entire cast of The Color Purple onto the show that the so called feud was addressed. It turns out Oprah actually ran into Whoopi at Tyler Perry's party sometime around 2006, just after the snub. Goldberg confronted Oprah, leading to a hilariously adorable moment between them. She asked if she was mad at her, to which Oprah said, I thought you were mad at me. Well, that's crazy. They mutually agreed that they really should have just picked up the phone a long time ago and settled the dispute. Number 10, Tom Cruise's cookie dough. Tom Cruise is known to have a bit of a bad temper. According to Leah Romini, Tom once lashed out at his assistants after he couldn't find a tube of cookie dough when Leah and her husband Angelo were over for a visit. She claims that Tom asked his assistants to prep the cookie dough, and when he walked into the kitchen a few minutes later to find no cookie dough waiting for him, he flipped. Tom went off at his flustered assistant, grabbing a science book, holding it above his head, and telling the assistant, <clears throat> L. Ron Hubbard is here, Dave and I are here, and you are down here. According to Leah, the assistant had the fear of God put inside of them because they knew what was about to happen. Romani diffused the situation by casually pointing out that the cookie dough was behind Tom on the counter the entire time. Tom is known for his temper. A former assistant revealed that when Tom turned 19, he threw a book at her head because the book was a bunch of Teen Beat style articles written about him when he considered himself an adult. The search associated with Tom has claimed that this never happened and it's just a story for Leah's book, but the assistants and Leah's husband were eyewitnesses, so nice try, science guy. Number nine. Bad parents. A large chunk of Leah Romini's book is dedicated to exposing Tom Cruise and his role in the scientific community. Apart from cookie dough, freakouts, and secret meetings, she mentions how terrible of a parent he really was. Tom and his ex Katie had their marriage after their daughter Suri was born, and in her book she speaks of their wedding day, where she discovered baby Suri on a tile floor surrounded by three women, including Tom's sister and his assistant. She was crying very loudly, and Leah claims that the women were speaking to her as if they were trying to calm down an angry and annoyed adult. Neither Katie nor Tom were anywhere to be seen when this happened, leaving a lot of people to question if Tom is even a good dad. We know he isn't these days, at least according to online sources and his family, but seems like Tom hasn't seen Surrey in years. Number 8, Sharon Osbourne. Sharon and Leah had a very bad public feud a few years back, but according to Leah, things are okay now. The two were co-hosts on the show The Talk, but Leah was let go following the very first season in 2011. At the time, Leah blamed Sharon Osbourne for the firing as they had apparently had an altercation off camera. Leah called Sharon out for supposedly using racist language when speaking in reference to a crew member, but Sharon claims that never happened. Leah said that at the time she believed Sharon was her friend, and because of that title expected a lot from the co-host. Host. The story was backed up by several co-hosts and more details were released. She had apparently been using some very poor words when speaking about her co-hosts Julie Chen and Sarah Gilbert. I will not repeat what she said because it is so rude and vile and just no. Leah also revealed that at times Sharon would even use slurs aimed at her that were usually associated with Italian people. When Romani would not support Sharon, she used the power behind the scenes to take Romani out for good. Number 7, John Travolta. Tom Cruise is not the only famous celebrity involved in weird science. Danny Zuko himself is a man who loves to read. In fact, he will tell you to do the same thing if you ask him why he's involved with the Church of Science. That's it. No explanation or what is in the book he's recommending. Just go find one and read one. Read a book! I picked Harry Potter. John is well known to have confirmed his involvement with the crew, but there is specifically one really unsettling thing about him, and is that he seems like an okay guy, but as I said, every time someone asks him about what it means, he tells people to educate themselves and read a book. I found so many examples of celebrities all giving the exact same answer when they're asked this question, and it's horrifying. There is no straight answer, it's very weird, they tell you to go to a library, that's pretty sus. Number 6, Jada Pinkett Smith. For those who don't know, Jada lives in a world of science, but she 
I can't even talk about what that means. Oh wait, <laughs> you'll know what it means. Leah Romani, who you might know from King of Queens or Old School or just all the movies that she's in, is very outspoken, especially against Jada. The rumors that Will and Jada were big into science was something that Leah mentions in her book, Troublemaker, Surviving Hollywood and Weird Science, and she brought it up again when speaking to the Daily Beast in 2017. She claims to know for certain that Jada was involved for a long time. She had seen Will once in a blue moon, however, she did spot Jada attending several events at the Celebrity Center in Hollywood. When Leah claimed to have knowledge of this, Jada clapped back on Twitter, naming all of the houses of worship that she's visited without being an actual member of them. A year later, they appeared on Red Table Talk together to hash things out, and after the interview, Jada gushed about how they connected in the interview, and said that they were two broken little babies inside of them that just were abandoned by their parents. And Leah was like, man, that lady needs help. Number five, Giovanni Ribisi. Giovanni Ribisi, best known for his more comedic roles in movies like Ted, is another celebrity that is openly linked to the world of science being another celebrity that encourages people to read a book and educate themselves instead of him having to explain the unexplainable. Gio actually used to practice Scientology alongside his co-star from My Name is Earl, Jason Lee, aka Earl Hickey, who you will know from plenty of great movies. Himself and Leah had butted heads for years, but back in 2016, the release of her book prompted an even greater hatred. These two have been at each other's throats ever since. Metaphorically speaking, it would be pretty weird if every time you went outside there was just Leah Romini and Giovanni Ribisi brawling on the streets. You can sell tickets to that. Gio is not the most famous person in this book to be exposed, but he is mentioned, so he counts. Number four, Maggie Gyllenhaal. Maggie and Leah used to be very close when Leah was a former member of the Weird Science, but she has had a massive falling out with the group ever since. The controversy led to several altercations and rifts in friendships. Following her exit from the church, Maggie and Leah continued to argue and battle with each other as to what the superior decision was. The better place to be for Leah was behind a desk typing her feelings into a book. I've never read this book, so if you have Good for you. I barely had enough mental capacity to read the articles about this lady, let alone her actual words and thoughts. Maggie is just another celebrity that wishes Leah would stop telling so-called lies and misleading the public into thinking that the group are a bunch of famous nuts who play hide and seek together from time to time. Uh, guys, Leah didn't make you look like that. You made you look like that. Number three, Elizabeth Moss. Star of the popular series Handmaid Tale is another celebrity involved in the church, and this video is quite literally just a list of people involved in weird science that Leah Romina either has a beef with or has some kind of feud. Elizabeth and Leah have actually only crossed paths a handful of times, but each seems to be worse than the last. Leah is blasted by any and all celebrities linked to weird science, with Elizabeth just being one of the more shy of the bunch. Herself and Leah have been fairly reserved in their feud, with the only knowledge of its existence coming from Leah herself. A few years back, Elizabeth shared some of her views on the science side of things, and her words caused Leah to label the crew as a cult, and that their sole goal was to grow their numbers. Leah tore Elizabeth and her statements apart, causing a back and forth that lasts to this day. The argument is literally just the two going back and forth, claiming that the other is the reason for their annoyance. We've all been there. Number two, Kirstie Alley. If there has ever been a difficult clip to watch on this list, this is the one. Leah Romini writes a lot about the celebrities she knows to be involved with the group, including Kirstie Alley. Kirstie is best known for her role on Cheers and in movies like It Takes Two. But if you are a fan of cringy clips, you might know her best from her season on Celebrity Big Brother. During her time on that show, she was asked about her beliefs a few times, but the best clip comes from her interaction with fellow castmate from that season, Rodrigo Alves. She tells her that the best way to educate herself is to read a book. Hey, hey, I already said that before. But unlike TV hosts and interviewers in the past, she pushed further, telling Kirsty that she is right there, ready to go, so you could just explain what would be in the book, right? To which Christy said no. Rodrigo had her own set of issues on that season, but this moment really stuck into the minds of those who witnessed it. Like, why not? Why do I have to go read a whole book that you have already read? That'd be like going to a doctor's office and them being like, oh, I know what's wrong with you, but you have to read my medical school journals to figure it out. And at number one, Dancing with the Stars. A few years back, Leah was asked to be a guest dancer on Dancing with the Stars. And as the season progressed, more and more backlash came up, mainly from the science community voicing their annoyance that she was fine to be on a show and dance her heart out, but 
other active and vocal members like Tom Cruise and John Travolta or anyone else who was on this list are questioned at every turn. Leah responded to the hate by informing people that the show that she was on had nothing to do with her views and was simply something fun that she wanted to participate in and she was asked to do it. So this might have been part of the reason that she left the group for good and every time she tried to exist outside of it she was just questioned and brought right back in. The Smith family has been in major gossip sources almost every month for the past three years. It seems as though they may never catch a break, but more importantly, it seems like we, the gossip people, will never run out of content and anecdotes. Jumping right in, we have their separation. Jada recently revealed that the pair, who everyone assumed was still unhappily married, have actually been separated for years, and everything that has happened between the two since 2016 has all occurred when they were not in an official relationship. And wow, a lot has happened. The separation was revealed alongside a myriad of other strange confessions and was followed by some even crazier revelations, which we will get into. The two say that they have always loved each other very deeply and that they always will, even going so far as to say that they are not planning to divorce, but they wanted to officially separate and provide each other space, which brings us to our next point. Up next is the revelation that Jada and Will were in an open marriage. I mean, this comes as no surprise to anyone, right? Like, come on. now. A couple years back, this was all anyone was talking about. How Will Smith and Jada were in an open relationship, but only Jada was partaking openly, and by that I mean in the public eye. The man that Jada had begun a relationship with actually moved into the house with the happy husband and wife. This arrangement definitely created an even more tense environment for the group of them, and I can't imagine having to live with that. I mean, my parents split up earlier this year, and living with them even for one month while things got packed up was a pretty awkward and tense experience. Thinking of one of them inviting their partner to come live with us? Yeah, I'd press pause on that one. Some secrets should not come out, like Jada's hesitation to marry and the emotional reaction that she had on her wedding day. Jada and Will got married when they were very young, and it was actually Jada's mother who pressured her into the marriage because she really liked Will and saw a lot of potential in him. However, that decision aged poorly, obviously. For Will's birthday, she posted a fairly old photo of them with their two kids and one of Jada's sons from her previous relationship. Many fans sent birthday wishes, but there were a few, a good amount, who made snarky remarks and rehashed lines from red table talks, contradicting the photo in the post. Some people commented on how she didn't love him romantically, and a clip came up of her saying how she cried all the way down the aisle because she did not want to be married to him, and how she felt pressured to be wed even though she never wanted to get married. Next up, we have the bonus son. Well, many know of the existence of Jaden and Willow Smith. Not a lot know about the existence of the third son. Trey Smith was the product of Will's previous marriage to Cherie Zampino and tends to fly under the radar in the eye of the media. In 2018, Jada brought Zampino on her show and spilled the tea on the real story behind Trey, their relationship to each other and Will's role as his biological father. For many Smith fans, this is the first time anyone had even heard about Trey. Will claims that he had to distance himself from Trey and his mother following the divorce. Will recounts struggling to maintain a healthy enough relationship with Zampino for him to play the role of Trey's father figure. Trey was raised by his mom alone, growing up feeling betrayed and abandoned by Will. Eventually, Will made amends and became a proper part of Trey's life, but for a long time, Trey was kept hidden from the public, surely leaving a stain on the family unit that can never be washed away. Next up, Complex Grandpa. This one is really dark. Like, okay, kind of in a funny way, because it's not actually actually dark. I guess like the dark thing didn't happen, but no, it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty dark. Will Smith released a memoir called Will in 2021 that was chock full of info that you would have to waterboard out of me or pay me a huge sum of money. Okay, yeah, I, I, I get it. Will proceed. The actor explains that while he was growing up, his father physically harmed himself and his mom on continuous and frequent occasions. So, in return for this treatment, he vowed to seek revenge for his mother when he was older and capable of more. Eventually, his father was diagnosed with cancer and Will was forced to care for him while he was bedridden. Will saw this as the perfect opportunity to take his dad down. He wrote, One night, as I delicately wheeled him from his bedroom toward the bathroom, a darkness arose within me. He then went on to describe the moment he contemplated pushing him down the stairs. He noted that no one would have suspected him and the moment was just perfect. He wrote, I'm one of the best actors in the world. My 
my 911 call would be Academy Award level. Will ultimately decided not to end his father's life, instead taking care of him until his passing in 2016. Of natural causes, I think. Next is dating pre-slapgate. Ahead of the release of her new book, Worthy, Jada Pinkett Smith has revealed a ton, a ton of information once thought to just be rumors. Well, we've already covered the fact that she has been separated from Will Smith for a while now, another fun piece of information has also been revealed. I don't know if it's fun, but it's information. Anyway, it's been revealed that before Chris Rock was slapped across the face by Will Smith live at the Oscars, Chris had actually asked Jada Pinkett Smith out on a date. Now, when you hear that, you must think, oh, he asked her out before they even met. Nope. The situation actually took place in 2016 at the height of the first round of separation rumors, which it turned out are completely true. At the time, Chris either had some inside info or he believes everything he reads online. According to Jada, Chris reached out and shot his shot, I guess. He called and he said he would love to take her out, which she was like, why? He clarified and told Jada he was under the impression that herself and Will were getting a divorce for real. When she revealed that this wasn't the case, Chris was so embarrassed and began to apologize over and over. Though they eventually moved past the moment, it may explain why Will Smith was so aggressive with Rock at the Oscars. There's no way he was unaware of the situation. Next up, we have the Smiths' self-raised tots. Rumors have been flying around for years that Willow and Jaden Smith basically raised themselves. Their upbringing was nothing to scoff at. Jaden was on track to becoming an actor after starring in the 2008 remake of the classic Karate Kid series alongside martial arts and opera legend Jackie Chan, but later shifted his focus to a more entrepreneurial side of things, developing his own fashion brand, which has garnered him massive success. His sister Willow opted to stick with her creative roots, however, has made quite the name for herself in music. Unfortunately, their behavior comes from a place of neglect. During an episode of Red Table Talk, Jaden confronted his parents, calling out their terrible parenting skills. With both being so busy in their careers, they were never home to care for the youngsters. Jaden and Willow recount spending a majority of their childhood with various nannies and teachers only seeing their parents between projects or if they were working with their parents, like Jaden and Will in the pursuit of happiness. It turns out they were all well aware of the whole separation thing from the very beginning as well. Will and Jada must have been waiting until the kids were financially independent and out of the house to finally call it quits, something they should have done a lot sooner. In that same vein, we have the horrid story of Willow Smith's stalker. In 2021, on her mother's talk show, Red Table Talk, Willow Smith revealed the heartbreaking, terrifying tale of her being cyber stalked. Cyber stalking is a little bit more insidious and scary. This guy was doing that to me, and he was actually doing that to me for a couple of years. He basically got my patterns, Willow Smith had stated. In December 2020, while on a vacation and absent from her house, the stalker broke into her home. Her mother, Jada Pinkett Smith, located a camp that was set up behind the house created by the stalker. His intention was to wait for Willow to return home. Jada immediately called the police, and the authorities recommended throwing out the contents of the fridge and cabinets in case the stalker had placed something harmful in the food. Willow Smith decided to take the stalker to court, filing for a restraining order against him. It was discovered that the man had been stalking her online for years. The restraining order was granted, but Willow Smith still has severe trauma from the whole experience. Next up, we have the birthday brawl, literally. For Jada's 37th birthday, Will decided it would be a great idea to throw a massive surprise party. Now, it wasn't just their celebrity friends, some close family and what have you. He hired party planners to set it up and spent three days planning and getting everything ready, which really isn't that much time. He even booked Mary J. Blige to perform for her. Talk about a birthday gift, but that was not all. He traced her family roots and invited her family members from her long line of lineage. Not only did he find her family, he went out of his way to reach out and invite them to the party. You'd think she'd appreciate this labor of love, uh, but instead she threw it back in his face, claiming he only did it to display his ego, and she hated the fact that he went out of his way to throw a party. He admitted he was devastated when she said those hurtful things, and it even sent him on a downward spiral that negatively impacted his life. This should have been one of the biggest of many red flags. I mean, if somebody just brought my entire family just from nowhere, that would be pretty scary. I, I don't I don't think I'd like that either. I'm kind of with Jada on this one. Finally, we have Tupac. Jada was in a long-term relationship with Tupac years before she met Will, and his untimely passing was the end of their relationship. It's normal and even healthy to miss someone who passed, especially when you were romantic 
romantically involved with them for years. But in 2012, while she and Will were still married, she posted a picture of her and Tupac in a very intimate embrace, and she captioned the photo, I miss him. It makes sense wanting to share your deep feelings with the world, especially when they're affecting you the most. But that was a questionable photo to choose to post, especially when you're married to someone else. Not to mention Will and Jada's daughter, Willow, wrote a letter addressed to Tupac after he passed because Willow claimed she knew he was still alive. One of the lines in the letter read, can you please come back so mommy and me can be happy? I think my mommy really misses you. It seems sweet and rather innocent, but at a young age she was aware of how much he still had a hold on Jada, and she wanted him to come back into their lives, which at that point seemed like it could have been the end of Will and Jada's marriage. Nothing came of it, obviously, but it makes you question how much Willow actually knew about the situation. Number 10, Cry Me a River. Cry Me a River by Justin Timberlake is a very catchy song. It's pretty mean and clearly about Britney, but still very catchy. When the song was first released, Britney was sideswiped, even though the music video was clearly aimed at Britney, even casting a lookalike to play an unfaithful girlfriend. In The Woman in Me, Britney's new book, she reflected on the plot of the 2002 video, describing it as a woman who looks like her cheats on him and wanders around sad in the rain, which is a pretty solid summation. The media backlash from the video painted Britney as a harlot who had broken the heart of America's golden boy when she was actually comatose in Louisiana and he was happily running around Hollywood. Comatose in Louisiana sounds like the title of a book about a young man trapped in the swamps of Louisiana. I gotta write something down. Britney admitted that she was unfaithful to Justin in a way. She kissed choreographer Wade Robson while she was still dating Timberlake, but following the split in 2002, Justin went public claiming that he would not tell anyone who his songs were actually about, telling people they were self-explanatory. Well, karma came back to bite him when a book about his misdeeds was published and sold out in the first week. Number 9. Oh Baby Baby It should come as no surprise to anyone that Britney Spears is one of the first people I will be talking about today and will talk about a couple of times because she literally wrote about this man in her memoir exposing every little secret that he once held dear. The world now knows that Britney almost had a baby with him but that he encouraged her not to have it, something she went through with and regrets to this day. I've not personally read Britney's memoir yet, however it is on my wish list so we'll see how much terrible stuff there really is inside its pages. One thing that was revealed that is public knowledge is just how much shame Britney felt when Justin released his song Cry Me a River, which I've already talked about. Too bad for Britney, it's pretty catchy. The song was claiming that Britney had cheated on him, but we all know now that it was actually the opposite and he actually cheated on her. The entire argument is only solved when you choose a side, so you be the judge. Number 8, Take Back the Night. It would appear that Justin's been too busy bringing stuff back for him to do some basic research. When Justin decided to call his next single Take Back the Night, he had no idea that the same name was already trademarked by a foundation for people affected by physical mistreatment that has been holding emotionally charged campus events since the 1970s. Thankfully, the internet exists and education took place. Justin was forced to release a public statement apologizing for his actions, actions that he really wasn't even aware of. He said upon the release of his new song Take Back the Night, he was made aware of the organization of the same name called Take Back the Night Foundation. He took the opportunity to let everyone know that neither his song nor its lyrics had any association with the organization. As he learned more about the Take Back the Night Foundation, he was moved by their efforts to stop violence against women, create safe communities, and encourage respectful relationships for women, something that we all really should rally around. He hoped that the coincidence would bring more awareness to the cause. His words did not make things instantly better, considering he admitted to not knowing the cause even existed, further showcasing the need to spread the word. The foundation sent Justin a letter claiming that there would be legal action for using their name without permission, something that was eventually settled outside of court. Number 7, Time's Up. Sometimes people should really think before they do something, like when Justin and his wife Jessica Beale posted photos of themselves wearing hashtag Time's Up pins on their way to the Golden Globes in 2018. Yes, at the time there was a ton of online presence for the Time's Up movement. Most of the celebrities in attendance at the awards that year were wearing nothing but black and supporting the ants. And the reason people were upset with how Justin did it was because he had just started a project with Woody Allen. For those who may have forgotten, the Time's Up movement was an initiative by women in Hollywood calling for a change in the treatment of women across all industries. Woody Allen is a controversial man because of the 1992 investigation into the concerns that he had physically mistreated his daughter, Dylan Farrow. Woody was never formally charged, but the accusations followed him everywhere he went. This led many people online to call Justin out for the hypocrisy of wearing a pin 
while working with Woody. Justin was blissfully unaware of the controversy, but he apologized for it anyway. Number six, Vegas. When Justin sat down for an interview with Beats Radio One, he talked about his new album, Man of the Woods, family life, and his career path. When he was asked about the possibility of taking up residency in Vegas, though, he responded by saying it was something to consider if he ever wanted to retire. He continued saying that it would feel like planning a retirement. For some reason, that was a scary thing for him to think about. A lot of performers have purchased property in Las Vegas, not as a retirement spot, but just as like a home base whenever they're performing for extended periods of times. The comments were considered to be pretty rude, especially to anyone that is not a celebrity living in Las Vegas. And according to Justin, everyone in town is in their retirement stage and therefore are old. He's received a fair share of backlash for the comments, but has yet to actually purchase any property in the town or apologize for them. Number five. The bet. Betting your friend to do something stupid is pretty fun, okay? It's pretty awesome, but betting your friend to do something to another person can be a little bit gross. Of course, in this case, the bet was made when Justin and his childhood friend Ryan Gosling were only 12 years old. The bet was to see who could kiss a certain lady first, and that lady was Jessica Simpson. As luck would have it, Jessica and Justin crossed paths a few times over the years and eventually sparked a romantic connection in 2006, following Simpson's split from Nick Lachey. During their brief romance, he recalls a time when she spotted Justin texting someone moments after they had locked lips. To her, maybe she did a bad job or he was messaging another girl, something weird, but it turned out that he was just texting Ryan Gosling, Ken himself, to let him know that he had indeed lost a bet. She then admitted that she had a little bit of a crush on Ryan growing up and that Justin was lucky to have gotten there first. They of course broke up, but Jessica has very little to say in negative reference to Justin, so let's move on. Number four, The Social Network. Having just seen the film The Social Network this past week for like the 10th time, I understand where the star of the film Jesse Eisenberg is coming from. In The Social Network, Justin plays Sean Parker, who's a real person who famously invented Napster and was then arrested and charged for a number of misdeeds, only briefly covered in the movie. In the years that follow, Jesse Eisenberg has been fairly closed off about his time on set, and why wouldn't he be? Jesse Eisenberg, there are probably a million DC fans out there who are ready to just cave his face in at a moment's notice. However, when he is pressed about his time working on The Social Network, there is one constant that Justin Timberlake did a great job. Now, when someone does an incredible job on set, that's usually a good thing, but not when the person they're playing is known to be a playboy with a penchant for the underage. While there is, of course, nothing tying Justin personally to that Sean Parker character, I do have to say, just after watching him in the role and everything that's going down in the past couple months, it's just a little bit scary how many times I forgot I was watching a movie. Number three. Wifey. Justin's current wife is no stranger to her husband being a pain in the neck. One night a few years back, Justin was spotted holding hands with his Palmer co-star, Alicia Wainwright, while he was still very much married to Jessica Biel. Of course, the internet being what it is, saw that this man was holding another woman's hand and they were like, oh, they must be a couple. He's definitely cheating on his wife. I'm sorry, but that is very silly, and if you saw that picture and assumed that, you are also silly. Justin was forced to release a public statement clarifying that he had in fact not done anything bad with his co-star at all. He had a bit too much no-no juice and wasn't paying attention to how he was behaving. He claims to have grown close to his co-star, but in more of a brother-sister kind of way. Jessica forgave him, but he continued to showcase a pattern of careless actions, and he has used offensive accents and language during interviews and even while on stage performing his music. Because Justin associates himself with rap a lot, he seems to think he's good to use slang and speak with an accent that just doesn't sound right coming out of his face. Jessica and Justin posted photos together for the hashtag Time's Up movement, and for those of you who might have forgotten, I did just mention it, so you shouldn't forgot. You shouldn't have forgot that, so just saying, bad move, j Dog. Number two, cut it out. Musician SZA had to deal with Justin in a very public way on the now cancelled Ellen DeGeneres show. SZA and Justin were brought onto the show to discuss a collaboration, but it seemed like whenever Ellen was trying to ask a question, Justin felt that it was necessary to give the answer. On top of that, he continuously calls her sis and speaks with what many people agree are stereotypical catchphrases and mannerisms usually linked to people of color. So many people took to Twitter following the interview to ask why he was talking like this and why he was talking over her so much. What is with the voice. And if this man calls her sis one more time, people did not know what they were going to do. He was accused of cultural appropriation, only speaking this way when SZA was there, but as a lot of people know, he doesn't tend to speak with any specific mannerisms. The interview was uncomfortable and it clearly started some tension between these two. And at number one, the court jester. In doing research for this video, I found over like 20 examples of Justin Timberlake making a fool of himself in public. He pretended to be prince at a Golden Globes one year and crouched down 
down to five foot two and did a busted impression of him. Not a good move. He has a pension for impressions though, as he also did this to Rihanna's mother as he accepted his American Music Award for Best Male Soul R&B Singer. He doesn't research the names of other things before he uses them, like the Take Back the Night situation and the anti mistreatment organization thing. He literally paid someone to pretend to be Britney and crash a car on camera for his music video to what goes around comes around. I could go on all day about why this guy isn't great, but I will save that for another video. Number 10, Jennifer Aniston nearly quit. Jennifer was the last to sign for the final 10th season of Friends, and she very nearly didn't return at all. Part of this was down to her busy career because at this point, she was definitely one of the most famous of the Friends cast. She had several movies on the slate. She later revealed that she was debating not coming back because she had a couple of issues that she was dealing with at the time. Jennifer said that she wanted to end the show when people still loved them and they were on a high. She also questioned herself about how long she really wanted to play Rachel. Jennifer obviously eventually agreed to the final season, but she is the reason why it's the shortest season, because she only agreed to return if it was cut short. Luckily for everyone, she decided to stay and felt bittersweet about the final season, and in the end she found herself wishing that it could have continued on. Most of the cast members' careers have crashed and burned after Friends ended, but Jennifer Aniston was a rare exception. She went on to star in several Hollywood blockbusters like Bruce Almighty, Breakup, Marley and Me, Just Go With It, Horrible Bosses, and Where the Millers, all of which were very successful at the box office. Number 9, Matthew Struggled With Substances As we know, Matthew Perry's sudden death has completely shocked the world. The beloved actor was found at his home after an apparent drowning. He was only 54 years old, and his passing was an absolute tragedy. Many of the Friends cast struggled to deal with their newfound fame, and for Matthew, this led to problems with addiction, which he has been extremely open about in his memoir. Although he said that he was never drunk on set, he did admit to being painfully hungover to the point that everyone became aware of. After more than one stint in rehab, he managed to get clean, and then he became very passionate about helping other people who were struggling. Just last year, he revealed that he and Jennifer Aniston had stayed in each other's lives, and they remained in close contact. He said that it was actually Jennifer who confronted him first about his addictions during the filming of the show. Apparently, she approached him during a break and told him, we know you're drinking. And looking back on that moment, Matthew thought that it was very scary, because in his own mind, he thought he was doing a perfectly fine job of hiding his habits from his co-stars. At a certain point, they all knew that he was in trouble, and they did their best to support him. Number 8, Lisa Kudrow sued the show. Lisa Kudrow's manager Scott Howard sued her in 2008, a year after she ended her contract with him, and four years after Friends ended. Howard claimed that Lisa owed him residuals for the reruns of Friends and other projects that she had worked on while under his management, to the tune of 10% of everything that she got. He stopped paying him when the contract was dissolved and argued that the 10% was only payable when he was managing her. Eventually, he won the case in 2014, and the judge awarded him $1.6 million. Of course, for someone who earned $1 million per episode for the final seasons of Friends, that figure wouldn't have put too much of a dent in her bank account. In a statement, Elisa's attorney said, the jury's verdict is merely one step in the legal process. This case will ultimately be resolved at the appellate level. Mrs. Kudrow has faith in the judicial system, and she believes that the eventual outcome of this contractual dispute will be in her favor. In a statement of his own, Scott Howard's attorney said, what generally happens now with unsophisticated actress clients is they overpay for filing a frivolous appeal that has no chance for success. So this legal battle got extremely messy in the end and it must have been embarrassing to be a part of. Number 7, David Schwimmer went into hiding. As we know, David struggled with the fame that came from being such a huge hit at such a young age. Of the main six actors and friends, he's the one who has shied away from the limelight the most. Although he continued to work after the show ended, he spent many years performing preferring to do voice work, directing, producing, and has been candid about struggling to find a way to continue acting as he's such a huge celebrity. He said, it was pretty jarring and it messed with my relationships with other people in a way that took years. I need to kind of adjust to and become comfortable. It made me want to hide under a baseball cap and not be seen. So I was trying to figure out how do I be an actor in this new world, in this new situation. Friends was such a huge hit from the moment it premiered that it didn't just bring fame to its stars, it brought a mega level of fame that is hard to understand. For David, it was just too hard to deal with. So much so that it didn't just affect him, but his relationships and other people as well. He was also an actor who, as a part of his craft, liked to be anonymous and observe people out.
out in the world. But of course, he simply could not do that anymore once he reached that certain level of success. Number six, Matt LeBlanc was arrested. Before he became famous, Matt was already getting used to that crazy party lifestyle that most people associate with being a celebrity. After Friends was finished, he admitted that he was arrested for drunk driving twice. He said, when I was young and stupid, I wasn't driving fast, just crooked. This came up when he was cast as one of the hosts of the new Top Gear, and fans were not sure whether a history of reckless driving was a good thing when it came to presenting a show about cars. Matt dismissed the incidents as a product of his age, although he has said that he's grateful the press never got a hold of his mugshots. While his drunk driving record happened before fame and fortune came to him, he also got into some pretty dark times when it came to dealing with his newfound fame. He nearly had a nervous breakdown due to the intensity of working on Friends, especially when the show came to an end. Speaking about that time, Matt said that for years and years, he barely left the house because he was so burnt out. He wanted not to have a schedule and not to have to be anywhere. Luckily, he was in a position financially to be able to do that with all of his savings, but of course his agent was not too happy. Matt said that was a very dark time for him and it even led to a nervous breakdown. Number five, Jennifer Aniston's wedding. While not every cast is close off screen, the cast of Friends was known for being friends in real life, as well as having a huddle before each episode started filming and negotiating their salaries as a team. The cast were often photographed out and about together and they talked in interviews about how close they remained, even after the filming ended. I mean, Jennifer Aniston is even godmother to Courtney Cox's daughter. But in 2015, when she married Justin Theroux, she didn't invite any of her male co-stars to the ceremony. It was a small wedding with only 70 guests, but it did include Courtney and Lisa. Matthew Perry said that he was surprised he wasn't invited, but he was still very happy for the couple, despite the awkwardness of rejection. Hopefully though, he didn't take too much offense, considering that Jennifer didn't even invite her own mother to her wedding with Brad Pitt in 2000. In an interview with Ellen in 2018, she opened up about why she went years without talking to her mother, Nancy Dow, saying, quote, she was critical, she was very critical of me. Because she was a model, she was beautiful, magnificent, I wasn't, I never was. She added that her mother was very unforgiving and would often hold long grudges. They ended up reuniting several years later, and by Jen's marriage to her second husband, Justin, in 2015, they were finally on speaking terms. But the funny thing is, Nancy still wasn't invited to that wedding either. Number four, David's neighbors hated him. Even stars have feuds with their neighbors and David Schwimmer is no exception. In 2010, the star bought a property in the East Village, townhouse from 1852, and of course the land that it stood on. But he decided that rather than renovate it to keep up the facade, he would just tear the whole thing down and start fresh. It's something that a lot of property developers are known for doing, but it's never really a popular decision. As a result, an anonymous neighbor left a message for him that was too big to ignore. For some reason, they decided it would really upset him if they spray painted in huge letters on the construction site fence. They wrote the words, Ross is not cool, which is both hilarious and kind of genius because it actually echoed a storyline from the show, where Ross moves into a new building and becomes enemies with the neighbors by not chipping in for the maintenance man's retirement gift, which kind of goes to show you that life really does imitate art. There's no saying how David reacted to this, but you can imagine that he wouldn't be too pleased that the construction site had graffiti. Matthew's extreme anxiety. Matthew Perry admitted two years ago that he suffered from anxiety, which often came when he was trying to be as funny as he could in front of the live studio audience while they were filming Friends. The admission came up during the HBO Max Friends reunion with Jennifer Aniston, Courtney Cox, Lisa Kudrow, Matt LeBlanc, and David Schwimmer. Matthew said that trying to be great made him extremely nervous, and his co-stars at the reunion said they never had any idea that he was suffering on set because he always delivered such a fabulous performance while being seemingly at ease. He said to me, I felt like I was going to die if they didn't laugh. And it's not healthy for sure, but I would sometimes say a line and they wouldn't laugh and I would sweat and just go into convulsions if I didn't get the laugh I was supposed to get. I would freak out. His co-star Lisa was shocked to hear that. She said that Matthew was always such a cool cucumber and he was one of the best on set, always delivering a line well as he played Chandler. Even though he never said anything to his co-stars back then, he felt this way every single night. And as we know now, his time on Friends was significantly impacted by his addiction. Memoir controversy. One surprise takeaway from Matthew Perry's autobiography was his apparent feelings towards Keanu Reeves after he repeatedly questioned why other actors die while Keanu is still alive. Quote, why is it that original thinkers like River Phoenix and Heath Ledger die, but Keanu Reeves still walks among us? Upon learning that another former co-star Chris Farley had died, he wrote, 
I punched a hole through Jennifer Aniston's dressing room wall when I found out. And in the next line, he wrote, Keanu Reeves still walks among us. Matthew would later apologize for the comments and then release a statement saying, I'm actually a big fan of Keanu. I just chose a random name, my mistake. I apologize. But that wasn't it at all. There was also a lot of other interesting admissions in his memoir. Another thing he also revealed is that he asked out Jennifer Aniston before filming Friends. He said that the two of them were the only friend stars who knew each other before the show, having met three years before through mutual acquaintances. In one part of the book he wrote, I was immediately taken by her. How could I not be? And liked her. I got the sense that she was intrigued too and maybe it was going to be something. Safe to say that fans were more than shocked by that revelation. And number one, everyone was scared of Matt LeBlanc. Now Joey is far from a scary guy, but when Matt LeBlanc was first cast in the role, some of the other cast members were a little bit afraid of him. This fear was based off of what they knew about Matt himself. The fact that he was raised by a mechanic and had done a stint as a male model as well, and had done a stint and had done a stint as a male model, as well as what they knew about the character of Joey, who was known as a very forward womanizer. Jennifer Aniston in particular remembers being intimidated before she met him herself. She said, I was scared of that type of guy. He thinks it's very funny now and actually he can sit down and comfort me just like Courtney or Lisa could. So it's a good thing that Matt turned out to be just as much of a sweetheart as Joey was, despite a slightly rocky start. Number 10. Tragedy. One of the more truly tragic revelations since the book's release is the fact that Megan suffered a loss very late in her journey as a mom. Within the final pages of the poetry book, Megan describes the heartbreaking pregnancy loss that she suffered with her fiance Colson Baker, better known as MGK. Megan told Kana Whitworth from ABC News that she had never been through anything like that before in her life. She has three kids already, so it was very difficult for both of them and it sent them on a very wild journey together and separately and together and apart trying to navigate what everything means and why it happened. Megan has made it clear since day one that this is not some expose memoir that you're going to sit down and read for 20 hours on end. This is a collection of truth told through her words. A story that needed to be shared or it was going to make her sick. She's dealt with physical violence from exes, manipulation, tragedy, all these things that she's had to deal with alone or behind closed doors. While she never names any names in her book, we still feel our hearts ache and wrench when she reads a single sentence. Number 9. Addicted to Boys The title of Megan's book of poems is called Pretty Boys Are Poisonous and is filled with multiple excerpts regarding her past relationships. One thing that she's spoken about briefly in interviews about this book is the fact that she was addicted to boys and had a history of getting together with her co-stars. She told Drew Barrymore on The Drew Barrymore Show that when she was young she was really rebellious and wild, always running away to fall in love with a new flame aka every single co-star. She added that at the time she felt herself to be a free spirit and was just addicted to the idea of falling in love. She went on to tell Drew that it was actually her kids, Noah, Bodie, and Journey, that changed her whole mindset on relationships and love. She shares her three sons with her ex, Brian Austin Green, and she claims that something happened when she had her first child. She realized she didn't want to repeat the pattern of her own parents with her kids. Despite being a solid mom, she did admit that she's been a little bad in the past, admitting that she painted a Friedrich Nietzsche quote on an ex's wall in a ton of paint just so they had to redo their room, poking fun at herself by saying anyone who dated her should write a poetry book as she was not a peach. Number 8. Oxy and Takiki. There is a poem in this book that shares a similar name to this entry, kind of, I'm not allowed to say the real thing on the internet. And restrictions. Megan revealed on Good Morning America that she has been in several physical and mentally damaging relationships. I know that's not even close to the right word to use, but again, can't say the real one. She explained that she was involved with a very famous dude, but that nobody knew that she was dating him. This unnamed celebrity is one of the men described as an evil ex in this book. In her poem, she describes a dark moment with this unnamed man, writing, Your eyes go black, and I know it's too late to run. She told people that she was pinned, spat on, and later had hands placed on her throat by a delusional and possessed man. I had the opportunity to listen to some parts of this book and I am saying this with 100% sincerity, go read this book. Megan is a wonderful writer and I honestly feel like these words are so powerful. This particular one is indescribable, like I can't read the entire thing because it's got so many no-no words in it, but also I just 
I don't want to ruin it for you. Number 7. MGK Rumors Cheating rumors are always circulating about everyone. Nobody believes that Hollywood icons can partake in a normal, healthy relationship. For Megan and her fiance MGK, there have been rumors forever. Since the first day that these two were spotted together, people have been convinced that MGK is somehow an unfaithful maniac. But like, why do people think that? Not sure if you've listened to this guy speak about his music or just in general recently, but he's a bit of a sweetheart. I watched this this man paint his nails with Drew Barrymore on her show. They talked about life, career, and so many cool things, yet the internet looks at this man and just assumes that he's a menace. Well, the rumors were of course false, and Megan Fox actually had to clear the air herself. There was a rumor that MGK was seeing someone named Sophie, who was MGK's guitarist. Megan cleared the air and let everybody know that not only had MGK never cheated on her, she was actually pretty close with bandmates and was confident that Sophie and her fiance were not an item. Megan told people that it was extremely disrespectful to run a new story that was baseless and contains only lies. Very true. Number six. 2009 Golden Globes. Now this isn't a revelation from a book, but it's something that she had to go through publicly and it does deserve to be mentioned. In 2009, comments started flying left and right after Megan Fox was spotted acting a little bit strange at that year's Golden Globes award ceremony. She explained that during the event, she was placed at a table with Blake Lively and the Jonas Brothers. In the center of the table was a bottle of Moe Champagne. She went through multiple glasses of that very quickly. At the time, she was not much of a no-no juice indulger, but following her actions at the event, she decided to quit for good. She actually had herself a good old fashioned blackout at the event, but the parts that she does remember are not great. She went on the red carpet and said a lot of things that apparently got her in a ton of trouble. In a clip from 2009, Megan can be seen walking around telling people how nervous she was to be there and that she was on the verge of tossing up her cookies at any moment. She also made a ton of comments on her female co-stars. Nothing bad. Just one quote I found in particular was her expressing how much she wanted to have Salma Hayek's chest. The evening was also a bit strange as people were wondering where her husband at the time, Brian Austin Green, was. She told people that he was a man with an ego and that he didn't want to be her date. Number 5 shoplifting. Megan's done a lot of things over the years, and one of those things, as it turns out, is shoplifting. Not while she was famous, though. She did not pull a Winona Ryder. She actually stole a $7 bottle of lip gloss from the Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen makeup collection when she was still in her teens. She revealed in a resurfaced interview that the Walmart employees actually caught her and called the police. She was made to go to a real courtroom and appear in front of a real judge who gave her two options. Either she had to wear a sign that says, I stole from Walmart and stand outside for three days, or she could wrap Christmas presents. Guess which one she picked. So hey, uh, if you had Christmas presents wrapped at a Walmart in the US roughly 20 years ago, might have been Megan Fox. Hey, that's pretty cool. There is not a chance on this planet that that paper still exists, but hey, that'd be pretty valuable paper if it did. Number four, Michael Bay scandal. Megan has been featured in several films over the years, but it was an interview about her time working with Michael Bay that landed her in a lot of hot water. The original live action Transformers movies came out in 2007 and co starred Megan and Shia LaBeouf in the leading roles. Now, they were fun films on screen, but behind the scenes, there was apparently a ton of tension on set. According to Megan, who had previously worked with Michael on Bad Boys 2, working for Michael was like working for Schmittler. Fun fact if you had shh in front of someone's names, you can say it online. Loophole. Of course, Michael didn't appreciate being compared to like one of the worst men in human history, so many speculated that her being left out of the third movie might have had something to do with this behind the scenes drama. She went on to call him bland and claimed that he had no personality or social skills, which is just plain rude. I don't know why she had to say that. When the comments were made public, her career began to slowly suffer. Not only was she written out of the Transformer series, but she was forced to make a public apology and retract her statements following the slew of backlash. She she took a few years off, but Michael himself later acknowledged that there were missteps on both parts and accepted her retractions. But the pair were able to patch things up and work together on the live action Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle movies from 2014. So, yay us! Number 3. Me Too Movement As some may remember, the Me Too movement began back in the mid-2010s and acted as a conduit for performers to speak out against their fellow Hollywood peers and, you know, actually have their voices heard. Many celebrities were outed and the situations with them are so bad that I can't even say their names. But I can make up new ones. People like Bill Cos, Harvey Hamburger Shop, and Kevin Spaceman were at the forefront of these allegations. Megan was actually left out of this conversation at the time, and it was mainly due to her being annoyed at Hollywood. She had 
actually been trying to out some of her peers for years, but according to Megan, she was ridiculed every time she actually spoke up. For Megan, she had already expressed how uncomfortable she felt on certain sets, especially Bad Boys 2, where she was under a waterfall at the age of 15, and claims that she had tried to bring attention to the misogyny that exists in Hollywood long before the movement existed. However, the movement only made her a bigger punchline. Even when she attempted to branch out into more female led projects, she was apparently met with similar ridicule. She claims to have never felt truly included in the movement, but believes in it nonetheless. Number two, lied about LA. Celebrities indulge their stories all the time. Most careers are literally built on the foundation of lying for money. While Megan may be great on screen, she's apparently a wonderful liar off screen as well. During an interview with GQ a while back, she detailed her wild nights out when she first moved to Los Angeles, detailing a specific club that she used to attend regularly called The Body Shop. Inside, she met a woman named Nikita and fell hard. Megan explains that she would buy her things, frequent the establishments, and a few other steamy details that I can't get into. However, a few years later, the story was revealed to be heavily indulged by Megan herself. She said that the story was true, but she might have exaggerated some of the aspects for fun. For instance, she made it seem like the relationship between herself and Nikita was physical or romantic, but that just wasn't the case. She just had a crush and they got along. Simple as that. And at number one, legendary. While in attendance at the highly anticipated battle between Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier at UFC 264 in 2021, Megan made some observations about the former president, Donald Trump. During an interview with Jimmy Kimmel, she revealed that the entire audience was in awe of this man attending the event. She said that when he entered, it was to a ton of applause and that he was surrounded by tons of secret service agents, to which she said Trump was the legend. Now, when news broke that Megan called him a legend, there was a ton of backlash, but she quickly clarified what she meant with the statement. She said that she doesn't align herself with any political parties or individual politicians. She never said that Don was a legend. She said that his appearance at the arena was legendary, okay? She ended the statement by sarcastically saying that she appreciated the uneducated, medieval, pitchfork carrying, burn a witch at the stake mentality that the world needs more of. Well said. Number 10, Justin Timberlake. One of the most discussed sections of The Woman in Me, a memoir by Britney Spears, is of course a revelation on what really happened while she was dating her Mickey Mouse Club co-star, Justin Timberlake. After meeting JT in the clubhouse, the two sparked a romantic connection, and their connection was strong, but unfortunately, Britney had to make a terrible decision in the year 2000 when she found out she was pregnant. And at first, she was very excited about the whole thing because she wanted to be a parent. In her book, she revealed that she had planned on starting a family with Justin, but I guess it was just going to be a little bit early than she expected. Well, it turns out Justin, not so excited, and told her that they were both too young to start a family, continuing to remind her that their careers would also need to be put on pause. This revelation may be part of the reason that Justin reportedly was so nervous leading up to the book's release, and since the book's release, he's had to turn off his Instagram notifications because, hey, he's terrible and people want to let him know. Brittany revealed that if the decision had solely been left to her, she would have gone through with a pregnancy, but she decided to go the opposite route instead. She claims that she only did this because Justin clearly didn't want to be the dad, and in the book she said that looking back, it was one of the most agonizing things she had ever experienced in her life. Number nine, Jamie Foxx. So this is one of the more recent secrets that's been revealed, so to speak. Uh, so far, this is just an allegation, but a woman is suing Jamie Foxx for alleged physical mistreatment at a rooftop restaurant. The allegations are being backed up by a two eyewitnesses, a friend of the victim, and a security guard who saw the whole thing go down and let it happen. According to the unnamed woman, she spotted Jamie at a restaurant around 11 p.m. and after a couple of hours decided to ask him for a picture. Jamie was apparently under the influence and according to the accuser, he became very handsy as the night progressed. He said yes to the picture and then apparently said that the woman had a model's body and smelled good. Then there are some darker and honestly pretty disturbing details that I can't go into in this channel, but if they're true, something tells me Jamie's career may be done. Truly just dark stuff. The court case is being brought forward as the Survivors Act is about to be implemented in the US. This act allows victims of physical offenses to bring civil cases to court after the statute of limitations has expired. The statute means that after a certain amount of time has passed, the victim can no longer file criminal charges. However, the new act means that civil cases are good to go. So we will see what happens to Jamie in the coming weeks. Number eight. 
Lizzo. Lizzo may have been a public advocate for body positivity, but as part of the lawsuit being brought up against her, it looks like all that positivity may have just been an act that she was putting on to make herself more universally loved. Now, I'm not a small man. In fact, I have what many call a dad bod, and I'm very cool with it. So I'm not dismissing the notion that we should love and respect ourselves, but come on, she made it a massive part of her personality on camera when it sounds like the only body she actually cared about was her own. According to her dancers, Lizzo regularly shames her team and makes them feel that they are too large or gaining weight, with several dancers confirming these claims. One of the dancers, Crystal Davies, who is part of this lawsuit, was fired for secretly recording a meeting between herself and Lizzo. The meeting was about the dancer's performance on stage recently and her apparently disliking the weight that she had been gaining, claiming that she wasn't committing to the role. She was also bringing her dancers to weird places and making them do weird things. Lizzo was at a club at Amsterdam's Red Light District when she coerced, aka forced a dancer to touch a woman's bare chest despite saying no several times. She also made them eat bananas from some no-no zones. Again, nobody's idea of fun. Currently, there is still a court case up in the air and no one knows what will happen, but so far Lizzo is maintaining that she did nothing and will prove her innocence. Number seven, Russell Brand. Even before the controversy surrounding Russell Brand came up this year, this dude was unwelcome everywhere. Royal events, awards shows, kids' birthday parties, who knows? For anyone who doesn't know, I'm really sorry to be the one to tell you, but Russell Brand is a terrible person. The man known best as a comedian, a bringer of joy, was secretly manipulative, aggressive, and at times violent with his ex-partners. Following in the news that a documentary about his life and career was set to release on BBC's Channel 4, several complaints got filed against him, alleging mistreatment during their time together. The allegations were actually reinforced by Russell's ex, Katy Perry, who they dated for quite some time, and she came to learn that Russell was short-tempered, opinionated, and stubborn. Russell's career was canceled, and he's currently awaiting a trial. Number six, Jonathan Majors. Jonathan Majors is currently the man behind Kang the Conqueror in the MCU. He was written as an important person in that franchise, being a villain in a couple of movies and recently a villain in the Loki TV show. Unfortunately for Jonathan Majors, an ex has come forward and alleged that Jonathan was physically violent towards her while they were together. Since March of this year, Majors and his team had been adamant that the situation was blown out of proportions and that there really is nothing to be upset about, which is always a fun thing to say to people during these situations. In fact, in June, Majors filed his own cross-complaint accusing his accuser. The prosecutors refuted these claims and told him they had no plans on prosecuting Grace Jafari, who was the woman who accused him. Majors has been dropped from his agency, and so far, his role on TV and film is pretty up in the air. I mean, his character Kang may even be kicked out of the MCU and replaced by Doctor Doom, so let's see what happens as the year progresses. Number five, Jada Pinkett Smith. Cheating rumors and dating scandals followed Jada and Will throughout their entire relationship. Since day one, people were convinced that they were in an open relationship or had just been straight up cheating on each other. Turns out that those rumors were kind of true, because ahead of the release of her book, Worthy, Jada sat down with People Magazine and every other news outlet to share some inside info. The most revealing one was that herself and Will Smith were actually separated for seven years. Of course, that's not all though. Jada is slowly ruining that guy's life and then some. When Jada revealed the truth about her separation from Will, she claimed that by the time they reached 2016, they just became exhausted with each other. The news of their separation was a mild shock at best because Super Sleuth fans claim that they had proof Will and Jada were separated a long time ago. Some of the clips that were submitted as evidence of Will and Jada just prove it because Will and Jada was on Red Table Talk and he looks drained. He just looks like a man dealing with so much mentally speaking. In her conversation with Will, she literally says that herself and Will had basically broken up, but instead of just outright admitting the information, she decided to hold on to it until the release of her book. A lot of Jada fans commented on the resurfaced clips, and we can all agree just Will is having a rough time, and I, I just feel for this guy at this point. I could go on and on about how terrible Jada Pinkett Smith is, but I've only got a couple of minutes, and I already wrote a lot of lists about why she's bad, so go check him out. Number four, Mark Wahlberg. Mark Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch hit the rap scene in 1991. Despite sounding like the title of a cheesy kids cartoon, the crew had a small following and garnered quite a bit of success. Enough for leading man Mark Wahlberg to be spotted, picked up by Hollywood to star in The Corrupter, a 1999 action flick that sees Mark play the leading man, Danny Wallace, a police officer who attempts to stop substance trafficking and corruption by the Chinese triads. He had a successful acting career that's recently been declining in quality, but he's still acting and he looks great at 52, so please 
don't hurt me, Mark Wahlberg. Growing up in Boston, he was the youngest of nine children and was relentlessly bullied by his fellow siblings. His parents divorced when he was very young and he became addicted to No No Snow by the time he was 13. He dropped out of high school and was eventually arrested at the age of 18 for attempting to slay two Vietnamese men. Apparently, he was walking home late one night under the influence of hallucinogens when he spotted the men. Close friends at the time confirmed that Mark did have a bit of a racial bias with his upbringing, which caused him to be instantly aggressive towards anyone who, you know, wasn't white. He attempted to swing a large log at them, which made contact and knocked one of them unconscious. He was eventually released after serving only 45 days of a two-year prison sentence, and he vowed to change his life forever. So far, that promise seems to be kept, and I can personally confirm that he's a very polite and patient person because he watched a movie at a theater I used to work at. He travels with like five people at all times. It's a little intimidating. Number three, Margot Robbie. Margot may be a perfect Barbie on screen, but apparently behind the scenes, she may be a psycho. In a recent interview with BBC Radio 1, Margot reminisced about a little prank she pulled on an old babysitter. It involved kitchen cutters, which is the word I'm forced to use for n See, they bleep it out. Apparently, Margot has just gotten a new babysitter, a much older woman that just was not as cool as Talia, her old babysitter. So she hatched a plan of sweet, sweet revenge. After a particularly trying day where Margot refused to take a bath, she decided to kick the old lady out for good and grabbed ketchup, a stabby jabby device, and laid face down on the kitchen tiles. You know, the old I'm kind of dead routine. As you may expect, her babysitter walked in, took one look, screamed, and just jogged out the door. She was gone. She traumatized the woman who quit, and Margot successfully got her old babysitter back. But that's very messed up, and Margot was so young when she did that. That is so dark. A dark place for someone's mind to go that early on. Was she secretly a little crazy this whole time? Might explain why she is the best Harley Quinn we've ever seen on screen. Number two, Tim Allen. Tim Allen is the voice of Buzz Lightyear, the star of ABC's popular sitcom Home Improvement, which premiered in 1991. And while he may have played a family man on TV, a lot of fans may not know that Tim was a smuggler of no-no snow in the early 1970s. According to Tim, he got mixed up with some pretty bad people back in the day while he was selling certain substances on the street for a couple of bucks. In 1978, Tim was arrested in the Kalamazoo Battle Creek International Airport and was caught with more than 650 grams 1.4 pounds of no-no snow. Unfortunately for Tim, state legislators had just passed a law that tied a life sentence to any conviction of selling 650 grams or more. Like there was a guy from the government just next to his car like, oh, 650, all right, well, if you got 650, then you're going to jail. However, that sentence was never served and it was revealed that Tim was set up by an undercover police officer who had been following him for months. Due to this and Tim's cooperation in providing the names of fellow dealers to the authorities, it led to him receiving a lighter conviction that allowed him to be sentenced in a federal court instead of a state one, so he was able to ignore that new policy. His information led to 20 arrests and the sentencing of a major dealer. So think about this entire entry and tell me that wouldn't be a great movie. Number one, Danny Matheson. Danny Matheson was that 70s show's popular boy and it helped launch several careers, including Mila Kunis, Ashton Kutcher, and of course himself. Danny was also on this show and it turns out the allegations against him date back to 2004 and were reported in 2004. Danny was still on the show when an investigation took place. Four women reported that he had mistreated them physically, prompting local law enforcement to halt production of that 70s show and bring Danny in for questioning. The investigation brought little to no actual evidence to the table because it was just that time, so Danny was let go and the whole thing was forgotten about. But that means that Ashton and Mila watched this dude shut down their project and still said, hey, he's a great guy. When the charges come up again 15 years later, people are still sticking to his side that he was friends with, but it turns out that he was an actual menace and a horror horrible person and he's gonna go to jail. Thankfully in 2023, it's a lot easier to confirm allegations like this and he was recently sentenced to three years in prison.